Hey, what's up everybody? This is DJ Martin, church pastor here at Parker Ford. Whether you're from Parker Ford or just watching online, so glad to have you with us today. We are continuing our series called Get Dressed. If you're not dressed yet, go ahead and get dressed uh, as we look at clothing throughout the scriptures and this imagery of clothing throughout the scriptures. If you didn't listen to last week's teaching, you might want to go back and listen to that one first because this one is definitely built on that one. Last week we looked at Isaiah 59. Today we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6 where Paul takes this imagery from Isaiah 59 and develops it into this incredible picture that he calls the armor of God. Before we jump into the word and the topic today, join me in a word of prayer. Let's ask the Lord to speak, to guide us, and to teach us. And uh, we'll pray it together. Father, uh, thank you for your scriptures. As always, it's a gift uh, to search them, to learn more about you through them and more about ourselves as they shine a light upon us and reveal things. And today as we explore the topic of getting dressed in the armor of God, uh, teach us how to be a people that are fully clothed in what you would have us be clothed in. Um, and uh, we're just going to ask this and believe it and trust you and live, uh, live this out uh, through your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been having so much fun thinking about this topic of clothing um, in the scriptures. When I started thinking about it, and I was looking at uh, passages in Genesis, and then thinking about it through all the Hebrew scriptures into the New Testament, just passage after passage, story after story kept popping off the page um, in my mind of, of just all of these stories that revolve around clothing and how much God talks about clothing. Right away in Genesis, Adam and Eve are naked and ashamed. They clothe themselves in fig leaves, trying to hide their nakedness and shame from God. What does God do? He pulls them out of hiding. He kills a lamb and he clothes them in the, the righteous, innocent clothing of the lamb which becomes the beautiful prophetic picture of Christ clothing us. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Then there's stories throughout Genesis about clothing. Noah gets drunk and is naked. His one son looks at his nakedness. His other sons clothe his nakedness. There's a story of Joseph um, and Jacob. Jacob gives him this uh, multicolored coat, uh, this robe, which is funny to think about in our culture. I don't think anyone's like, wanting a multicolored robe from their dad. But back in that culture, it was a big deal. And he clothes his son and all the other brothers get jealous and it leads to all of this craziness. And it revolves around the story of, of the clothing. Another passage in the scriptures about a robe and a father giving a robe. Think about it for a minute. Okay, it's in the New Testament. One of the pro uh, parables that Jesus tells. Yeah, it's the, the parable of the prodigal son where he runs off and he squanders his inheritance and then when he comes back, the father sees him in the distance, a long way off it says, and he ran to him and the son kneels before him and what does the father do? He takes off his rich robe and he wraps his shamed son in this, which is again the picture of father God wrapping his children in his clothing of righteousness. This imagery, I'm telling you, it just comes up over and over again in the scriptures. Last week, we focused on this passage in Isaiah 59, where God clothes himself. And it specifically says that he clothes himself with the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, with vengeance, and a robe of zeal, a robe of passion. Paul's going to take this imagery and he's going to riff on it and he's going to expand it and he's going to develop it in Ephesians. Right at the end of Ephesians, there's this beautiful benediction that we're going to pick up on starting in uh, um, verse 10. So if you join me there, you can follow along on the screen here. In Ephesians chapter 6, this is the clothing th uh, closing thoughts of the, the letter to the Ephesians. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We're not strong in our own strength. We're strong in the strength of the might of the Lord. Not by power, not by might, by my spirit, says the Lord. Paul emphasizes this. Be strong in the strength of the Lord's might and put on the whole armor of God. Now, he's specifically referring to Isaiah 59 where it talks about the incarnation. It talks about 
God entering into the equation, entering into life among humanity. He himself became the intercessor, as it says. He himself became salvation for his people. He himself put on the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness. Paul is saying to us, to the church, to the people of God, put on the same armor that God himself puts on. So verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We are not doing battle against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against other people. Our battle is is against the cosmic powers that wage against the kingdom of God. And when we put on the armor of God, when we stand in the strength of his might, and that's where our strength comes from, then we are able to stand firm. He says, therefore, verse 13, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. I don't know about you, but I want to be able to stand firm. When, when my life has passed and the fullness of it is spent, I want to stand firm in Christ and God. And the armor of God, clothing ourselves in the same way that Christ our Messiah, our King, clothed himself, is how we stand firm. Verse 14, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth. Paul starts with the image of the belt. Now, if you're thinking about a robe, we've talked about a robe a couple times already, so think about a robe. The belt is what is on the outside of it that holds it together. The truth of God, the truth of who he is, the truth of how he works, the truth of his character and his unchanging ways, it's what holds the whole armor together. And I think it's interesting that Paul starts with this instead of ending with it. So put on the belt, the thing that's going to hold it all together, put on the belt of truth. Secondly, he says, having fastened the belt of truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Think for a minute, what does a breastplate cover? What does it protect? It covers your heart. It covers your vital organs. It covers your lungs. It covers your chest, your chest cavity. It covers all of this. It covers your inner man. It's the breastplate of righteousness. I don't think it's any coincidence that Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. You s- we see God when we have a pure heart. In Proverbs it says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Or guard your heart above all else, for from it, from it flows the springs of life. In other words, your heart is giving shape to the way that you live. So protect it with a breastplate of righteousness. Protect it so that it can be pure. Protect it so that you can see God. Put on the belt of truth. It holds the whole thing together. And put on the breastplate of righteousness that protects your inner person. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, or as a translation, other translations put it, put on the, the boots of the gospel. Notice how he connects gospel, good news, with peace, wholeness, shalom, completeness. In Colossians 3, it says, let the peace of Christ guard your heart. We are, we are to be a people of peace, and everywhere that we go, we've got the boots of the gospel, and we've got the boots of the good news of the kingdom of Jesus, what he is doing, what he is building among his people, the ways that he is making all things new through his spirit. And wherever we go, we are to be a people that bring peace, that bring wholeness, that bring shalom. We're not just warriors that go slashing around, although there is a time to do battle, especially against the cosmic forces. We don't battle against flesh and blood. We battle against the evil uh, powers that come against the kingdom of God. And as we go, we bring the peace of Christ with us. Verse 16, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. Faith means allegiance, it means belief, it means trust, it means that 
we're going to obey God no matter how we feel in a given moment. So we take up the shield of faith with which we can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, those lies, the accusations, the falsehoods that come against the people of God and come against the church, come against the kingdom of God. We hold up the shield of faith. Imagine like a a picture of an epic battle where there's a line of well-trained soldiers who all hold up their shields at the same time and they create this impenetrable wall. That's what happens in the church. That's what happens when the people of God collectively are holding up their shields. It doesn't just protect you. It protects the people around you. We hold up the shield of faith not just to protect our own hearts, but to protect the church and the kingdom of God. In verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Hallmark would have us believe that our emotions come from our heart. But in the scriptures, our emotions are actually tied to our mind. And that makes sense because it's in our thought life that we feel things and we perceive things. So our emotions are taking place up here. Um, This is Larry Crabb and Dallas Willard, many other smarter people than me, have pointed this out. But it's in our minds that we feel things. And so it's no accident that we put on a helmet of salvation that guards our minds. It guards the way we think. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Transformation takes place in the mind as we learn to think like Christ. This is 1 Corinthians 2. This is Romans chapter 12. Uh, This is a number of places in the scriptures that talks about our minds thinking like Jesus. It's the helmet of salvation that protects it. And take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So Paul lists these six articles of clothing in the armor of God. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the boots of the gospel, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. What I want to leave us with today is this question. Which piece of armor are you in need of dusting off, sharpening, polishing up, and putting on? Think through, meditate on each of the articles in the armor of God, and be dressed just like Jesus dressed himself in each of these things. We too follow his example. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the armor of God. We thank you that Jesus lived this out himself. He put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, and lived it out. We want to be just like him, fully dressed in the armor of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.